So um, this is the season of fresh starts and new beginnings. It's the time when we make resolutions. Can you say yes? yes. It's a time when we dis- intentionally decide that we're going to stop this, and this is normally something that's not really good, and we're going to start that, which is normally something pretty good. We're going to stop this, start that, stop this, start that. Say that with me. Stop this, start that. Say it like you mean it. Stop this, start that. So we're going to get in shape physically. We're going to stay in shape spiritually. We're going to have healthier relationships, and we're going to eat healthier foods. Can you say yes? Yes. We're going to stop this uh, unhealthy things. We're going to start that healthy things. Can you say yes? We're going to do better in 2016 than we did in 2015. Can you say yes? Yes. Yeah, we want to stop this and we want to start that. We want to go to the gym more. We want to eat better. We're going to study the Bible. We're going to pray more consistently. If we're married, we're going to date our spouse. We're going to spend more time with our kids and our grandkids. And we're going to do better at work. And the list goes on and on and on. And I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but resolutions don't work. Uh, Look at this uh, article I read in U.S. News and World Report this week. It's brand new. Come the 1st of January, the hordes of enthusiastic resolutioners, that's not even a word, account for the swelling number of gym, yoga, and Pilates memberships as the diet books fly off the bookstore shelves. By the second week of February, some 80% of those resolutioners are back home with a new kind of remorse, staring back at them in the mirror, the remorse of disappointment. How many of us know the remorse of disappointment in February? Shoot, January 3rd, I know the remorse (laughs) of disappointment. We all know what it's like, you know, 80% failure rate. I know I'm not alone. So I've been thinking a lot about resolutions and these resolutions that we make. They're they're commitments, really, is what they are. They're commitments that we make. And, And I thought that I would share with you some insights. I want to try to unpackage um, three different kinds of commitments that I, I, I've discovered in life, and, and maybe this will, will help you. And the first one is um, these resolutions. And you can see on the screen, I asked Thomas to put a little dot, and that little dot is you, and that little dot is me. Because when it comes to a resolution, um, uh, it, it's all contingent upon my self-will, on how strong it is or, uh, or how weak it is. Uh, it, it, it's all dependent upon whether when I confront something in my life, um, whether I'm going to choose health or unhealth. So I come home from work, and um, Cheryl has made um, uh, plain chicken, okay? No, no cheese anymore, just plain chicken, right? <laughs> and plain broccoli. When we first got married, she used to put lots of cheese in the broccoli. And over the 34 years, the cheese went away and got replaced with salt and pepper, right? Just plain broccoli, plain chicken breast. It's like eating paper, right? And, and, and she, 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 you know, she says, we got to eat better, so we're going to do this. Now, because, um, because I'm the most loved pastor at Grace Church, much more loved than Wes and Kevin, Eric Ennis uh, gave me a giant tin of homemade peanut brittle. Yeah, and it's sitting, I, I don't love you enough to share it with you. It's at home. It's at home under, I won't give it to my grandkids, all right? It's under lock and key at home, and, um, and so I come home from work, and I get to choose, you know, paper-tasting chicken and broccoli or peanut brittle. And so because I'm a man of integrity and honor, I eat the chicken and broccoli when Cheryl's looking, and then I eat the... Yeah, all right, am I alone? Bunch of liars. Okay, bunch of... You see, again... Uh, my ability to keep my resolutions has everything to do with my self-will. There's a second kind of commitment that we make, and we call them contracts. Again, I asked Thomas to put two dots, because a contract is a two-way relationship. Uh, Take, for example, um, lots of people join gyms this time of the year. If you are a gym owner, congratulations. You put a good tithe check in this week. Um, uh, So I, I agree to join the gym, and I'm on one end, and I'm going to give $25 a month, and the gym owner, <clears throat> he's going to provide a clean, safe, healthy environment for me to work out at. And this, this contract works as long as I pay my 25 bucks and my gym owner uh, keeps the gym in shape. But the truth is, at any moment, uh, either side of the, that relationship can fail. The commitment can fail. You see, when it comes to resolutions or to contracts, There's limits, and it all has to do with our 
human self-will. There are limits. But the Bible speaks of a third kind of commitment that we can make in our life. And it's not dependent upon self-will. It's called a covenant. It's called a covenant. And covenants have three parties involved in it. In one corner is the individual, that's you and me, the follower of Jesus in one corner. On the other corner is um, other followers of Jesus. And then at the top is God. Now, um, in this three-way relationship that we call covenants, where we make commitments, there, there, there are at least three insights I want you to get a hold of, get your mind around. The first is that these covenants begin with an assumption that both the person making it and the people that he or she is making it with are limited. So when you read in the Old and New Testament, you read prayers like this, covenant prayers go like this. Hey, God, I can't do this. We tend to mess up. We tend to do the wrong things. So it was the wisdom of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous to begin the steps of AA with this statement. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. So you can take out the word alcohol and you put anything in there. We admitted we were powerless over eating right, over exercising more, over controlling our tongue, over spending money wisely. You can fit anything you want in there. We admitted we were powerless and that our lives had become unmanageable. Covenants start not with human strength, but acknowledging human weakness. Second added bonus to covenants is that we do it with other limited, weak, frail followers. We don't do it alone. We do it with other folks, and we need other people in covenants to assist us and to keep us accountable to our most sacred commitments in our life. The third insight that I think is important for you to know about covenants is that in the Bible, you make covenants before you need them. You make a covenant before you need the covenant. Let me give you an example. Last uh, Tuesday at 4 o'clock, I was standing on Lover's Key Beach with uh, Matt Hogenkamp and his new wife, Sarah. And Matt is a kid who grew up right here in our church, went off to Asbury uh, University where I graduated from, met an amazing young woman there, and we were uh, just delighted. We had a wonderful night there on Lover's Key Beach celebrating. We danced and we ate way too much food. It was a wonderful, wonderful celebration. Now, when Matt and Sarah were standing in front of me, they made some commitments, some vows, some pledges. They said that they would love, honor, and cherish one another. They said that they would stick together through thick or thin, through rich or for poor, in sickness and in health. Now, here's the question that I wondered after the wedding. Did they need those vows at 4.15, 4.45 on Tuesday afternoon? Well, no. They didn't need those vows then. Do you know when Matt and Sarah are going to need those vows? Six months from now, when Sarah comes home from her job at the university and Matt's underwear is sitting on the floor. <laughs> and Sarah loses her mind, right? That's when she's going to need to remember, oh yeah, through thick and thin, through richer for poor, I'm going to honor and cherish him, not stroke him. You know what I mean? I just, okay? So we make a covenant before we need the covenant. You could take all of this and wrap it up into this single statement. We make covenants, but the truth is our covenants make us. We make covenants, but the truth is our covenants make us. You see, a resolution and a, and a contract all depend on human strength. But a covenant begins with acknowledging that we don't have the strength and that there is one God who is powerful and, 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 and limitless in his power and can help us live into our most important commitments. So we thought it would be a good thing right here at the beginning of 2016, on this first Sunday, to consider our most important commitment, our relationship with God. And we want to talk about uh, one thing that we need to stop and one thing that we need to start so that our relationship with God in 2016 can be the best that it can be. Isn't that what you want today? God, you don't sound like a bunch of Baptists. 
If this was a Baptist church, somebody would be shouting. Don't you want a better relationship with God in 2016 than you had in 2015? Okay, goodness gracious. I thought I was, got warped back into another church. What happened? Okay, yeah, we want that. So here's the question. How can my relationship with God be different, better, if you will, in 2016? So when the teaching team met a couple of weeks ago to plan this, we thought that we would, um, and kind of felt the nudge of the Spirit, that we would go to a few verses that Paul wrote in a letter that he wrote to followers of Jesus in a place called Philippi, the book of Philippians. It's called the book of joy. 16, 17 times Paul uses the word joy or rejoice in this little letter. And he teaches us about how we can grow in our relationship with God. Two very simple insights, but yet they're pretty profound. Number one, stop trying. Stop trying. Say that with me. Stop trying. Now let me give you a little Bible history. The first followers of Jesus were Jewish. Now remember that to be Jewish in the first century, it meant that your greatest desire was to obey the 613 commands found in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And so that everything that you learned and everything that you were taught in your home and in the synagogue was about obeying these commands. And Jesus was a Jew, and he came along, and Jesus said, good luck with following these 613 commands. Good luck. He says, if you think you can get right with God by following these commands, by having all these rules and regulations about what it means to keep the Sabbath, good luck. And Jesus wanted to introduce us to a new way. And it wasn't a way based on our works, but a way based on his work that he would do for us on the cross and on the empty tomb. And so Jesus began to teach and model a new way with, to God, not through rule keeping, but through trust in the radical grace of God. And let me just tell you, it's still the truth today. So Jesus dies, he's resurrected, he ascends to the Father, and, um, and then he sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and they establish the church. Now you've heard the old saying, uh, uh, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. A lot of those old Jewish followers who are now followers of Jesus brought with them the baggage of this rule keeping. One of the big rules was that if you were a Hebrew boy, you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. So they were trying to teach Gentile believers, non-Jewish believers, that when they came to faith in Jesus, that they too had to be circumcised. So Paul writes them a letter. And in the letter, Paul is mad. I mean, this boy needs an anger management group, if anybody, right? Listen to what he says in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. Paul says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Now check it out. He calls them dogs. He calls them evil. He calls them mutilators. He's, he's angry. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. He's talking about a spiritual circumcision, not a physical one. Then read this next line with me. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. Underline that. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put, next two words, no confidence. Circle that. We put no confidence in human effort. Then Paul gets a little bit, it almost sounds arrogant. Though I could have confidence in my own effort if anybody could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I even more. So Paul says, listen, we don't put our confidence in our good works, our rule keeping, our regulations. He calls it human effort. He says we put our confidence in what Jesus does. We rely on Jesus. He says, have no confidence in your work. Would you say the word no confidence with me? No confidence. We're supposed to have no confidence. We're, he's basically telling us, will you stop trying to be Christian? Stop trying. Stop trying to keep all the rules. And then Paul gets this personal note in there. He says, I could have confidence if anybody could. And then what he does in the verses that follows, five, six, seven, he, he starts to say things like, listen, um, let me take out my biography, my vita, my resume. I graduated at the top of the class. I persecuted Christians. That's, that's how, how, how outstanding a follower of this Old Testament law I was. And then he says this. 
He says, you can stack up all of my religious duty and obligations that I met, and you could stack it up, and it would be a pile of manure. As a matter of fact, it's the only place in the New Testament where there's a cuss word. It's the word scubula in the Greek. Seen that bumper sticker that says, stuff happens? That's the word he's using. I'm not going to say it in church. <laughs> Paul's saying stuff happens. He's saying, you pile up all of my religious works. He says, I went to church every Sunday. I went to Sunday school every Sunday. You stack it all up, and it's a bunch of poop. It's a bunch of manure. He says, don't place your confidence in your religious credentials for the 20 years that I've been one of your pastors I've reminded you that um, that this trying to be Christian won't cut it matter of fact we've used around here a metaphor you, you've heard of the Avis rental car company there are Avis Christians they try harder right they just try harder you feel guilt you feel uh, you feel sadness you feel shame so you just try harder and that's not the way of Jesus we don't put our trust listen to me church don't put your trust in 2016 in trying harder you want to stop that Paul says put no confidence in it but he tells us he wants us to start something in the verses that follow we're going to start stop this and we're going to start that and what is that well number two we're going to start training stop trying start training say that with me stop trying start training say it again stop trying start training see Paul stacks up all of his religious accomplishments calls it manure and then listen to these words that he writes better yet read them with me from verses 12 through 14 ready go I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. If you taking notes would you circle the phrase press on right there near the end the last sentence circle the phrase press on see Paul says it's not in trying to obey the rules that we're made right with God he instead tells us to press on in essence Paul is saying listen you need to train to follow Jesus not try to follow Jesus let me try to give you this example um, I had knee surgery uh, at the end of October, and so I've been in rehab for the last uh, several weeks trying to get my legs stronger. And if I woke up yesterday morning and said, hey, I'm going to run a marathon. I mean, I'm talking about today. I'm going to run a marathon today. Uh, now, Kevin, how, how long is how a marathon? 26? 20, you don't even, yeah, I can tell by your body build, you don't know either. <laughs> Wes, how long is it? <laughs> Brett, Brett, how long is it? 20? 26.2 miles. Okay, so, so, so if I got up and said, I'm going to run 26 miles today, how would I do yesterday morning? How would I have done? Not really good, right? Right. You'd find me dead about mile marker one and a half, right? <laughs> but if instead I said in six months or eight months I want to run a marathon, and I started to train, you know, got that app, you know, from the couch to the whatever, you know, I'm not going to do it, but just say I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like that peanut brittle too much. No, no, I went to the gym yesterday, so yeah, okay. So, um, so yeah, it wouldn't work because I would be trying to run a marathon. I need to train to run a marathon. We need to train in our relationship with God. And he says we need to press on, we need to train on, but then he uses towards what? And he says towards perfection. And when you read that, a lot of you said, oh, I'm, I'm out of here, okay? But, but listen to me. Remember what Pastor West said to us. That in the New Testament, the word perfection means completeness. It means maturity. It, it means growing up. He says, you need to order your life and press on in your life so that you are growing up to be more complete in Christ. Being the person that God made you to be. I have a friend who's a therapist, and she's also a coach. And I asked her the difference between therapy 
and being a coach. She said, therapists for the most part are telling people to look in the rearview mirror of their life and try to fix the stuff in the past so that they can have a, a more healthy present. And she said, a coach is a person who tries to teach somebody to look through the front windshield so that they can realize where they are and then have a better future. Can I suggest that following Jesus is kind of like a combination of both? It's kind of allowing our rearview mirror to shrink down to its appropriate size. Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, good, bad, and ugly. And having a big windshield into the future and saying, God, what is my future in you going to be like? And that's what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to live your life looking in the rearview mirror with all kinds of regret over your failures or arrogance over your successes. Instead, he says, press on to the high calling of God that is yours in Christ Jesus. Listen to me, friends. You have a spiritual destiny for 2016. And God wants you to live into your spiritual destiny. But you have to train yourself. In 2002, I'd been at Grace Church about six years. The church had grown uh, four or five times bigger than it was when I got here. It was way beyond my leadership capacities. I got invited to go to Hawaii. And anytime anybody invites you to go to Hawaii, I mean, like, I'm all in. Any free impasses, I'm ready to go. And I went to Hawaii to spend a week with Wayne Cordero, pastor of New Hope Christian Fellowship. And I went there with my yellow, orange pad, uh, yellow pad to take notes on how to grow a big church. And what Pastor Wayne taught me was how to grow a big leader. And every morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'd meet him at Starbucks, and we would do daily devotions. And in one week, my spiritual life was jump-started. And for the last 13, 14 years now, I've been practicing this discipline of getting up in the morning. I've been training myself. That's what Paul told Timothy. He said, train yourself to be godly. I've been training myself. And I hear a whisper from the Holy Spirit. Do I do it every day? No, but I do it almost every single day. And it is a way of training myself. John Ortberg said this. He said, you are not the master of your soul, but you are the keeper of it. Nobody can do this for you, friends. And so if we're going to grow in our relationship with God, we're going to have to stop trying so hard and, stop and start training to become more and more like Jesus. I want to invite the worship team to kind of make their way in this morning. And let me tell you this story. Or this, this, uh, let me, let me to kind of close with this. I've said before that the most important um, commitments that we make in our life we tend to make in a place like this so I want you to think about this if you were raised in the church you were probably blessed to have your mom and your dad um, gather with you at a place like this and they either baptized you or dedicated you and said that they were going to raise you in the Lord in a Christian home and in a Christian church and then there came a later time in your life, whether it was confirmation or whether it was at some service where you came down and you knelt or you stood and you said, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you were baptized. And then there came a, a, a time in your life where you said, you know, I want to be a part of a fellowship and I want to make some commitments and I'm going to be a part of this church and this church is going to be my spiritual home. And, and you made some vows, some pledges, some commitments and you did it in a place like this. And then maybe uh, God brought a person into your life, a woman or a man, and you stood before pastor like uh, Matt and Sarah did with me, and, and you took vows, and you did it in a place like this. And then maybe God gave you children, and you dedicated or baptized them, and you committed to raise your children in a Christian home and in a Christian church, and you did it in a place like this. And I don't mean to be morbid, but someday you will die. And we will gather in a place like this. And what we will talk about is about your commitments. Did you live into your most sacred commitments? Were you a, a person of the covenant? When those early Methodists gathered together uh, 200, 250 years ago, John Wesley would either gather them on the last night of the year, the New Year's Eve, or on the first Sunday 
of the new year. And they would have a covenant renewing service in a place like this. And they would renew their covenant with God. When you came in to worship this morning, you were given one of these prayer cards. I'd invite you to take that out. And this is the prayer that they prayed. The more traditional version is in the blue. The more contemporary version is in the green. And I want you to take this home and I want you to put it on a mirror or put it at your computer or your desk at, at work or at home. And I want to invite you to make this your covenant prayer for 2016. Make this your prayer. And we're going to together as imperfect, limited, flawed followers of Jesus at this church called Grace, we're going to renew our covenant to God for 2016. So would you just first bow your heads with me? I just want to ask you to think about your relationship with God. Is the commitment that you've made to Jesus up to date? I want to ask you to consider maybe whether you've even made a commitment to Jesus. And maybe the thing you need to do on this first Sunday of 2016 is say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I've been making too many resolutions and too many contracts and breaking them both. I want to live into my covenant relationship with you. I want to stop trying and start training. How are you doing at keeping your soul? The words are on the screen. Let's pray this together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven.